Hello everyone, it's Mark Goodacre here. Welcome to the MT Pod, the podcast all about the New Testament and Christian origins. It's episode 36, and today we're going to take a first look at the Epistle to the Hebrews. One of the things I enjoy about teaching introductory courses on the New Testament is that you get a chance to get stuck into some of the materials that you don't normally have a chance to look at when you're teaching these courses on things like Paul and the Gospels like I teach at the rest of the time. And it's a shame because New Testament scholars tend to neglect what are called, for want of a better term, the general epistles, the Catholic epistles, those things that are kind of stuck away at the back end of the New Testament. And the epistle to the Hebrews is particularly fascinating. It's particularly worth spending a bit of time looking at in detail. You can see why it gets neglected. I mean, for one thing, we don't know who wrote it. And and that's kind of frustrating because you want to get a feel for the author. I mean, when you read Paul's epistles, you get a real feel for the personality of the man. And they become interesting testaments to what he is like as a human being. But when you read the epistle to the Hebrews, it's much less stamped with the kind of authority of the author. I mean, it just begins in the same way that something like John's Gospel begins. It just kind of launches in without any uh, kind of, uh, you know, to uh, a particular congregation or group of churches or anything like that. There's no preface, there's no kind of fanfare. It just gets straight on with the theologizing without hanging around at all. I mean, for much of its history, it has been seen as a sort of Pauline epistle, as a kind of 14th Pauline epistle in the Pauline corpus. But let's be clear, it's not written by Paul. There really isn't any good evidence that this is written by Paul, and it doesn't sound anything like Paul. I mean, it may be that the author of of Hebrews is kind of pitching into some of the kind of Paul letter sort of territory, because in chapter 13, verse 23, it has an interesting note that sounds like the kind of thing that Paul says. He says, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. So could it be that that's kind of evoking the kind of way that Paul talks? Well, maybe. But there's a real absence of explicit authorship here. Be clear about this, that the text doesn't make any claim about who its author is. And of course, that leads everyone to speculate about who its author is. I mean, one of the favourites is Barnabas, who uh, was suggested by suggested by Tertullian as a possibility at the end of the second century. Apollos is a is a favourite suggestion because this enigmatic character of Apollos is mentioned in Acts of the Apostles, and he has certainly has the kind of education and the and the right kind of background to have been the author of of uh, of the Epistle to the Hebrews, but. Uh, we don't really know who it is. I mean, my favourite theory is that this is the New Testament epistle written by a woman, because if it was written by Priscilla, the early Christian Priscilla, you might be able to see why it was anonymous, because she might think, gosh, you know, people, some people won't accept this epistle written by a woman, so she keeps her name off it. So that is, is one of the kind of most attractive suggestions. But the, the truth is, we just don't know who wrote it. And so what we have to do when we're looking at Hebrews is move to the 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 kind of the the issue which we can get at least a little bit of a handle on which is who are the recipients of the epistle to the hebrews well what kind of ideas can we have about who the recipients are who the audience is well does chapter 13 again provide a clue 1324 greet all your leaders and all god's people those from italy send you their greetings So is the reference to Italy helpful? Well, the difficulty is, it's so vague, isn't it? I mean, greet all your leaders and all God's people. That doesn't really narrow it down too much. And those from Italy send their greetings. It doesn't really help you a huge amount. So one of the things that people end up doing with the Epistle to the Hebrews is they try and mirror read, they try and work out what the epistle says and then work backwards to what must have been the situation of the people in the epistle. And there are a few things that you can you can find out there. I mean, in 12.4, for example, you get the hint that they're being persecuted, but not to the point of shedding blood. Or in 10.22, the author says that some of them have neglected They've started neglecting to meet, neglecting to meet together. And you might also point out that the reader's familiarity with the Old Testament is assumed throughout the book. I mean, there are lots and lots of rich quotations from the Old Testament. But the problem is, is that all of these things are such generic things in early Christianity that it doesn't really help us in narrowing down who the readership is. And then think about that traditional title, To the Hebrews. 
How revealing is that? Well, not very. I mean, do we think? I mean, Hebrews is a, is a term that's used of 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 kind of the 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 people of God in the Old Testament. So, is the author trying to evoke the idea that these are in some way people who are the fulfilment of those of the of, of the, that you read about in the Old Testament? Well, maybe he is, and if he is doing that, it's not really very precise either, is it? And to make it worse, the title to the Hebrews might simply be inferred by some of the earliest copyists of the text. It might be that they they read the text and they thought, oh gosh, who are the recipients? of this. We don't know who the author is, but who's the recipients of it. And they ended up saying to the Hebrews because they saw all of this material in it that reminded them of the Hebrew Bible. So maybe the very title is simply inferred by people copying the text and that we're none the wiser from it. So, so far we're not doing very well, are we? We don't know who the author is. We don't really know who the recipients are. Can we at least say what the epistle is about? Well, getting at the argument of Hebrews, getting at what Hebrews is all about, is a little bit more straightforward because he tells us, the author tells us this, or she tells us. And one of the key things is that Jesus is the great high priest. And unlike the high priest of the old covenant, unlike the high priests according to the order of Levi, Jesus doesn't offer bulls and goats, but instead he offers himself. So his sacrifice, the author thinks, is superior to theirs because of who he was. He is without sin. He makes an offering once for all and cleanse people forever by his blood. It's, it's an argument which make some kind of sense to Christians who are familiar with the idea of sacrifice for sin and Jesus sacrificing himself for sin. But it's easy to forget how odd this argument must have sounded when people first heard it. Because what he's saying is that the high priest, the true great high priest from heaven who is Jesus, actually offers himself. No high priest offers himself. High priests offer the offer animals for sacrifice. And then to add that this high priest is completely without sin. I mean, what he's saying, of course, is that because the thing that is offered himself is perfect, therefore he's able to make this perfect offering, and therefore he's able to perfect everyone once for all. And you don't have to have repeated sacrifices being made. But making this argument isn't at all an easy thing to do, because in order to be a priest, you need to be descended from Levi. And it was well known to early Christians that Jesus was not a priest, never claimed to be a priest, wasn't from a family of priests. Jesus, in fact, was always said to be descended from David. So he isn't a priest. He, he is in a kind of kingly line of the New Testament books, want to say, but not a priestly line. So how can you then stand up and say, ah, oh, Jesus was the great high priest? And in that whole problem is Hebrews' great exegetical opportunity. What happens is it, it comes up with a brilliant solution to this. And what it does is it says, ah, it says, yes, but Jesus isn't a high priest according to the order of Levi. He's not any old priest. He is the ultimate priest. And he is a priest descended from the order of Melchizedek. And then you might well say, well, who on earth is Melchizedek? And the author is aware that you might well say, who is Melchizedek? And he does a little bit of explanation about who the character of Melchizedek is. Now, Melchizedek is mentioned in one of the early Christians' favourite scriptures, Psalm 110. They were always quoting Psalm 110. And in Psalm 110 verse 4, there's this line, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, that mysterious reference to this Melchizedek character got early Christians thinking. And because they were already reading Psalm 110 and seeing it as a kind of prophecy about Jesus, then they started to say, ah, so if Jesus was a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, a priest forever, then perhaps indeed he was able to make the ultimate sacrifice as the great high priest, and a high priest after that order and not after the old order, so a kind of superior high priest. And the thing is, Melchizedek is only mentioned once elsewhere in the Old Testament. He's mentioned in Genesis 14 where it said that he 
blessed Abraham and uh, he brought him bread and wine. And that itself it, you know, kind of evokes really Christians' images of Jesus. So what the author to the Hebrews says is that Jesus is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He's kind of superior to Abraham because Melchizedek blessed Abraham and in Abraham's loins was Levi who, be, who who later led that kind of order of priests and the and, and the author to to the Hebrews uses this character to say that Jesus has achieved this ultimate atonement this ultimate going into the sanctuary making the perfect offering and so perfecting believers once and for all so it's a clever argument born out of an interesting exegetical difficulty exegetical problem and and it's it's an argument that the that the author makes with some considerable degree of skill even if when we read it today it can be a little baffling to us because of its massive emphasis on sacrifice and temple and tabernacle and all of these sorts of things now of course this just raises one further huge question why is the author spending all this time reflecting on Melchizedek, reflecting on Jesus, reflecting on sacrifice, reflecting on atonement, reflecting on what and how it is that believers come to be made perfect. And that is one of the biggest issues in the study of the Epistle to the Hebrews. Why did the author write it? What's the purpose of this letter? And that's a topic I'd like to take up next time in our second episode of the NT Pod devoted to the Epistle to the Hebrews. Well, thanks for listening to this latest episode of the NT Pod. You can find me on the web at podacre.blogspot.com. You can Google for the NT Pod, of course. You can follow me on Twitter at Goodacre. Or you can go to Duke University's iTunes U and find everything there. Thanks again for your company, and I look forward to being with you again soon.